Yes, of course, Dean. Uh, this is the sixth year that we've interviewed the mm -hmm. Good Heart Professor for the Archive, mm -hmm. and you have the chair for the academic year 2013-14. So I hope that in this interview we can perhaps talk about your your academic career, your professional career, and there'll be time as well for you to give us some of your observations about the Good Heart Professorship, your, mm -hmm. your tenure. Yeah. So. Could we start with your early life? Mm -hmm. You were born in Chicago in 1948. Right, I was born <clears throat> um, on the south side of Chicago into um, a, a close-knit community of um, Dutch immigrants. It was a small, close-knit community in a large city. So we found ourselves very much integrated and um, looking in toward each other. I went to um, a high school that was closely associated with the church that was um, in the center of this community, a kind of Dutch Reformed uh, church. And um, then went on to college um, again at a church-related school, Calvin College. Calvin being the inspirer of that um, denomination of the Protestant uh, tradition. Well, mm. I noticed with interest that the Calvin College in Grand Rapids, which mm -hmm. you began at in 1967, I wondered what subjects you actually studied at Calvin. My major was philosophy. Um, I started out thinking I might actually um, go into the ministry, but Philosophy captured my heart and mind. And so by the end of that um, oh, two or three years, um, I was um, thoroughly committed to doing philosophy. Calvin was a small school, um, small liberal arts college, but it had a, a stellar philosophy department, probably the best department in the whole school. And it was nationally known. So... While I got, while it was a small school, I got really the, a first-rate um, philosophy education there. You then went on to Cornell where you did an MA. And PhD, together, yeah. And <coughs> so did you like the sort of rural New York state? Yes, right, rural and um, uh, hilly and cold. Um, there is an interesting story about this. I went to Cornell thinking I would study philosophy, religion, and perhaps pursue a career in that. When I arrived on campus um, in August of 1970, having enrolled, um, I discovered that the one and only man that had been doing philosophy, religion at Cornell left seven years before that. So there was suddenly nothing for me to do. So I looked around a bit and I learned, oh, and, and during the summer, for some reason or other, I had read um, the classic uh, 20th century work in philosophy of law by H.L.A. Hart called Concept of Law. That's in 1970, it was written in 1961, so it was still new and very much discussed. I thought, well, that seems interesting. And then I also discovered that um, one of the um, most beloved and um, esteemed directors of uh, PhDs, David Lyons, uh, was David Lyons. And so I um, decided that what I would do is I would take up philosophy of law and I would study with David Lyons. David Lyons was on leave. So I looked to um, the law school and I found a man there called Robert Summers who was himself um, a good heart professor some years ago. And Bob Summers um, welcomed me with open arms and um, helped me plot out a, a law, a program in study of law um, alongside my work in philosophy for my PhD. Very interesting, because you spent a year in England, right. 73 right. to four, right. at <clears throat> University College, mm -hmm. Oxford, where you were a recognized Scholar. Mm -hmm. What specifically is that category? I think it it is for 
graduate students the equivalent of a visiting post. Right. Um, it was not a, it's not a degree granting uh, position, so there was no DPhil, no infill, nothing like that. Um, but I was able to work closely with, um, at that point, Ronald Dworkin. Oxford in 1973-4 was a very lively place for philosophy of law. Herbert Hart had stepped down. Um, Ronald Dworkin was, it took up his chair. Um, Joseph Raz was a very strong presence at Balliol. Uh, John Finnis, also at UNIV, um, was a very strong presence. And each of them were doing their most um, influential work at that point. They were, the books were published sometime um, various years after that, but um, they were all in gestation during that time. It was a very exciting time to be there. Um, and while Cornell was important for shaping my general philosophical um, education and perspective, uh, Oxford was extremely important in focusing my um, attention on um, law and on um, analytic legal philosophy, um, which then I pursued as I went on. Yeah. At this point, you were also a tutor in jurisprudence, right. but at Queen's College, at Queens, I yeah. wondered how this came Well, that's just because um, um, I um, was familiar with, um, had studied a good bit of um, uh, jurisprudence by that time, and Queen's was desperately in need of a tutor. Um, I was available and willing to, to step in. Um, it's, it's also an interesting connection because um, at that time I was working on Bentham and, and subsequent to that I worked a lot on Bentham and ben, uh, Queen's was Bentham's College. Though the connection wasn't clear to me at that time, but um, there was a kind of co um, an interesting coincidence over time. Just jumping from your past to yeah. late last year, uh, Thursday the 21st of November 2013, you gave a lecture at Oxford, Laws, Rule, Reflexivity, right. Manual Accountability and the Rule of Law, at a jurisprudence discussion group. Mm -hmm. Um, in the Oxford Faculty of Law Senior Common Room. And I wondered whether this provided a happy meeting of old acquaintances and friends. Um, there were um, uh, some students that I had actually taught in uh, North Carolina who had gone on to do work in Oxford, whom I met, and a few of my colleagues, but um, not very many of them, actually. Right. Um, it was a happy time to return. It was exactly 40 years from the time I had um, spent in, in Oxford, and um, I couldn't imagine that 40 years had actually passed. Um, um, Univ College wasn't particularly familiar to me. The law faculty at Oxford was very familiar to me. Um, and um, the, the lively discussion that we were able to have that day um, did remind me of a wonderful time I had it in Oxford. Coming back, or let me say, going back to your yeah. past again, after Oxford, you went to Cornell, where you did your PhD, I noticed, in three years' time. And what was the topic? Yes, well, um, what actually I did is I, I started Cornell in 1970. Um, I took a year away in 1973 and four, and then returned um, to finish my PhD. So I had already begun work on the PhD uh, dissertation when I went to Oxford um, and then studied lots of things there and um, some law, some legal philosophy, some philosophy, political philosophy, um, and then came back and, and um, applied myself to the writing of the dissertation. The dissertation was uh, on, in the philosophy of criminal law, on theories of punishment but I was especially interested in the relationship between theories of punishment and theories of justice or fairness in criminal procedure. I was exploring the relationship between them. Um, and to do that, I focused on two main figures. Um, one was Kant. He represented one very important uh, strain in um, theory of punishment, a kind of retributivist theory of punishment. And the other being Jeremy Bentham. Um, who was perhaps best known for his work um, in a kind of utilitarian 
um, theory of punishment. Um, it was because of that that I began studying Bentham, uh, Bentham's work more generally. Because Bentham, unlike Kant, Bentham spent um, a lot of his time over the years writing on issues about judicial procedure and evidence and just about everything else in, in law. Um, and while I finished up the dissertation, The Theory of Punishment, I put that aside and started working on Bentham um, for quite a bit after that. That really got me launched into the uh, uh, study of Bentham theory, theory in general. Very interesting. I wonder because your next paper, as yeah. shown on your CV, was about Bentham yeah, and his yeah, theory. Yeah. Um, and I noticed then, just moving away from that, that your first academic post was a part time lectureship at Johns Hopkins, which oh, seems to overlap with your mm -hmm. PhD. Yeah, well, that was a full time job. That was a full time position for five years. That was my first um, official post. Um, I was assistant professor there for five years. Um, during that time, um, I started work on um, um, Bentham's legal theory more generally. Um, and it's curious what I, I had looked at um, Bentham's uh, published work, which is at what was at that time, mid to late 70s, um, very little. Um, and very obscurely published. Um, there's a, a 19th century edition of his works that was badly edited and badly produced, but available. And I was working with that. And on the basis of that, um, hit upon a, a kind of conundrum in trying to figure out what Bentham's theory is all about. He seemed to be a utilitarian, um, and yet his views about law, and especially the necessary codification of law, didn't fit with his background, in my view, his background, moral and political views. Um, and I wanted to reconcile them. Um, I wrote a short paper on that, on Bentham and adjudication. And I thought, well, someone told me that there are a few manuscripts in London that perhaps I should look at. And so I got a fellowship towards the end of the 70s to spend six or eight months or so in London at University College London. Right. And there I discovered there was not just a few manuscripts, but an enormous volume of manuscripts. Um, and that launched me into a long study of um, um, some of the early manuscripts in particular and um, some of the later things um, in, in a more um, selective fashion, and that resulted ultimately in a book in 1986, uh, my first book, uh, Bentham and the Common Law Tradition. Um, so it was from this little, <laughs> little thought that there might be something that would help me resolve this conundrum, this puzzle, um, blossomed into a very large project, on which I'm in a certain sense still working. So still just tracing the trajectory of your career, in 1980 you joined the University of North Carolina, <clears throat> one of the oldest public universities mm -hmm. in existence since 1795, right. and you have been there ever since, you're mm -hmm. still there, Professor mm -hmm. Costuma. You, were, you became the Boss Hammer Distinguished Professor of Philosophy in 1997, and recently, simultaneously, Professor of Law mm -hmm. in 2002. 2002. And I wondered how these two roles combine. Well, I regard myself and have been trained as a philosopher, not as a lawyer. So I never did um, acquire um, the American um, law degree, um, called the Juris Doctor, J.D. Um, I did the, the equivalent of that. Um, you must forgive me, I think I know who calls me. Um, I did the equivalent of a first year um, program at Cornell, and I studied more law while I was at Oxford. Um, but my decision early on was that I'm a philosopher, not a lawyer. I have no interest in practice. Um, and at that time, one could. Um, study seriously law from a philosophical perspective or philosophical techniques without actually having practice. That's no longer true for my students. 
I need to practice, I need to have a law degree, but I didn't. Um, so when I got to North Carolina, um, I was hired in the philosophy department, um, and that has been, since 1980, my home. Um, as time went on, um, I um, more, got more and more involved in the law school at the University of North Carolina. Um, and in 2002, they appointed me as professor of law there. Um, though it's still, I still do just one quarter of my teaching time for them. Um, and most of my time is, for, is in the philosophy department. So I'm still um, primarily a philosopher, though I focus my philosophical attention on law, but not exclusively on law, but mainly on law. Mm -hmm. so I noticed that there is also a Boss Hammer chair in law, and I wondered whether there's any requirement in the bequest for yourself and Professor Tom Hazen to collaborate in your fields of study. Yeah, no, um, that's interesting, but um, I think that's sheer coincidence that the two of us happen to have this um, endowed chair. Um, both of us being in one respect or another in, in law. That's just simply coincidence. Yeah. Um, you've, during this time, your time at the uh, University of North Carolina, you visited Berkeley in 79, mm -hmm. Michigan 82, and Yale in 93. Were these sabbaticals? No, they were visiting posts. Um, they, Berkeley has um, a um, uh, had at that point in 1979 um, a unique um, PhD granting program in the law school that was I think unique for American law schools at that time um, it's now a bit more common but it was a PhD granting um, program um, which was highly interdisciplinary um, bringing together people in criminology and sociology and statistics and history and philosophy, um, and I was their resident philosopher for the term. Um, and the same, th and at Michigan I was visiting, and in Yale I was visiting again um, in the philosophy department, um, in both cases. Right. So before we continue, is the temperature fine in this room? Should I close the window? Or oh, it's is very it... nice. It's very yeah. Currently, you are the good heart professor. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask what courses you are teaching while you're here. Right. Um, I'm involved in two um, uh, philosophical, legal philosophical um, courses. Um, one um, in conjunction with uh, Nigel Simmons um, and Trevor Allen um, jurisprudence, and the other in conjunction with um, Matthew Kramer. Um, uh, a course called Topics in Legal and Political Philosophy. Um, I lectured in both of those um, pretty much full time in the Michaelmas term. So, although you are familiar with the Oxbridge teaching system, how do you find the system of supervisions currently in con contrast to what you are accustomed to? Well, the interesting thing here is that um, I was teaching LLM students, and unlike undergraduate instruction um, in law, um, the instruction of LLM students is not by way of supervision, but by way of lecture. So there was not a major transition right. from the kind of uh, teaching that I do um, back home in North Carolina and the, the kind of instruction that was going on here. Um, so it was primarily lecture. I was surprised. I expected it to be more seminar-like, um, but the courses were heavily enrolled. Um, we had about 25, I think, in the jurisprudence course and well over 30, maybe 35 or more in the uh, topics course. Um, so I was forced to do more directive lecturing than I norm normally would have that I had planned to do, actually. Right. Um, but that was okay. Um, my style, even when I'm lecturing, is not sort of monological. Um, it's rather more engaged. And um, I think it's, it may have been atypical for 
teaching here at Cambridge, at least lecturing. Um, the students seem to tell me that anyway. Um, I regard um, philosophy in general, as my colleague once said, um, I regard philosophy as a contact sport, and so I need to have contact with my students. Um, and um, that's where the interesting intellectual engagement comes. Um, um, I need to feel their, their um, response and their, in, their um, interaction if I'm going to be able to um, address them and educate them and, and, and um, um, make them feel the importance of the kind of ideas that I'm arguing that I'm looking at. So much more engaged kind of activity. Um, and in that respect, it was great fun. Um, the students very much responded to that. Um, I had, uh, um, each time I had great fun, different kinds of people would participate. So um, it was not as unlike my ordinary experience back home, um, although I think in some respects it was more engaged. Thank you. Um, Professor Postuma, how do you view the college-based system here um, in contrast to most faculties yeah. where it's strongly centralized? Right. How do you find this arrangement? Well, I was familiar with it, of course, because of my experience in Oxford. Um, and it is very different indeed. What um, is, I suppose, the most palpable difference is that um, in, within the college, one has intellectual contact with colleagues across disciplines, um, widely across disciplines. Um, when I'm back in my own institution, I'm, I rarely see people in the natural sciences. Um, sometimes see people in the social scientists sciences, um, sometimes people in, in other humanities departments, but my colleagues with whom I interact on a daily basis are strictly my philosophy colleagues or law colleagues. Um, and of course in the college system it's very different that way. Um, and the same thing with the students, they're, they're much more diverse um, in their interests and um, so I find the smallness of it and the, um, so the autonomy of these various kinds of things brings um, different people together in a way that I find really uh, energizing. And your research focus while you are here? Right. Um, it is, um, I have, it's hard to count them, two, maybe three projects. Um, the one project is to continue work that I've been doing, articulating a view about the nature and sort of underlying foundations of the idea of rule of law. Um, I've now written two or three papers and I will soon be given, giving the Boutwood Lecture at Corpus Christi College uh, in late February um, and the topic will be on rule of law and what I take to be, the, I call it the ethos or the culture that we need of rule of law is to be vibrant and robust in a political community. Um, I argue there for the essential feature of a kind of mutual accountability across all the parties um, and all the institutions in a, in a political community. Um, and I'll be explaining um, and developing that idea even more in the outward lecture. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm working on that idea. Um, um, the main public um, publication project is very different, though it's, it has, it's indicative of the kind of... Um, way in which I wrote, work philosophically. Um, I'm, I've got a contract with Oxford University Press to produce um, a collection of, of works by um, the 17th century jurist Sir Matthew Hale. Um, there is an unpublished manuscript in the British Library of um, some hundred or more pages, um, a treatise on natural law, and another only um, obscurely published um, essay um, in critique of the important English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Um, and I'm putting, um, transcribing and um, editing those and then adding to that um, um, a selection of um, essays and other um, portions of works of, of Sir Matthew Hale. So it's something like the, um, the jurisprudence of Sir Matthew Hale. 
Um, that's an editorial project, um, not a philosophical one, but it's, it indicates one way in which I approach my philosophical work, which has always been through the history of philosophy, through the history of um, legal theory, and in this case, through the history of um, law itself. Um, I am a philosopher. I, I address contemporary uh, issues of contemporary legal and political philosophy and, and ethics, um, but always through the lens and um, against the backdrop of my work in um, the history of uh, philosophy and the history of law. So Bentham, the common law tradition, is um, a, a major um, piece of work in which I did just that. Um, through working on Bentham and the common law tradition and David Hume, um, I was able to address and bring to, um, at that time, the Middle Ages, um, a perspective on core issues that were being debated at the time in legal philosophy. Um, that's always been the way I approach things. Um, I will then, um, after I f pretty much finish up the um, editing project on um, Sir Matthew Hale's work, um, um, put together a, a, a book on Hale and Hobbes and perhaps Bentham on some key themes, the nature of law, the nature of legal reasoning, um, authority and sovereignty. Um, I haven't decided whether to put Bentham into the picture yet, but it will certainly be on Hobbes and Hale. So there's the philosophical side of the, of the editorial work. Very interesting. And this brings us now to your scholarly output. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I've had to be restrictive here, A, because of your very large output, and of course, my very restricted knowledge. Mm. So I focused on your first publication. Oh, you did. Uh, which I'll come to shortly, and your two books in which you were a single author. <coughs> and I hope that we can go through these now. Mm -hmm. So your first paper was published a year after you left Calvary College. Right, it was written while I was an undergraduate. Um, and then it took a while to, to publish it, yeah. And, of course, the school was dedicated to Calvin, and I wondered if this was what inspired the title and the subject matter, mm -hmm. Calvin's alleged rejection of natural theology, and it's published in the Scottish Journal of Theology when you right. were 23 years old. Right. Right. Well, um, yes. Um, Calvin develops in his um, most famous work, The Institutes of Christian Religion, um, works within a, um, a largely scholastic um, philosophical framework. Um, so he develops a um, what in philosophy we call an epistemology, a theory of knowledge, um, and then works within that to develop his um, um, core theological doctrines, um, the nature of scripture, the nature of, of God, um, the um, status of human beings relative to God and the like. Um, he opens up some people say he opens up um, the whole enterprise, enterprise by saying we should not approach these questions from a, from a philosophical or a natural theology perspective, but from a perspective that's distinctively scriptural and internal to the religious tradition. And what I did is I took that on. I said, no, I think there's really a philosophical project here. Um, that he really has and presupposes um, um, an epistemological framework and a certain metaphysical framework, um, and we need to see that if we're going to understand well his theology. Um, it's interesting because what it what that paper <laughs> indicates is that I was a philosopher, but I was also a, um, an adherent to the theology to a certain extent anyway. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I could combine those, and this was an expression of my um, attempt to find in the text itself some support for that, uh, that um, approach, a philosophical approach to the issues of theology at the time. So, have these influences guided your future career in the law? Um, largely no, um, although um, the one thing that's true about the Reformed Protestant tradition 
is that it's very serious about its um, about the role of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible um, in its understanding of, of um, major theological issues. Um, the, one of the core concepts in that tradition is the concept of covenant. And it turns out that I am now at work when I'm not working on Rule of Law or Matthew Hale or Jeremy Bentham. I'm working on um, a project which make I might be able to bring to completion this year as well um, on a, a paper and maybe something larger on, on the theme of covenant as a political idea, not a theological one. Um, so I find myself coming back or feeling um, some affinity to um, and some expressive resources in that tradition. Of scriptures. Um, um, and, and especially this Reformed theological tradition that... Um, um, it has strong connections or possible roots with, with Judaism and, and Jewish views of things as well. So um, I'm finding those notions um, to be richly suggestive, not for theological purposes, but for purposes of understanding um, the nature of political obligation um, and, um, well, and that sort of thing. Just coming back to something that you mentioned, you, you, you concluded in this paper with a qualified yes, that Calvin did assert the validity of natural theology and that one can contemplate God through the scriptures. Uh, you also claim that Calvin implied that one could find knowledge about God even apart from the scriptures. And on page 430, you implied in your conclusions, page 430, or three, four, that one has to believe in God for a reason, and that faith cannot be irrational. I wondered, Professor Faustina, whether you've modified your views on this over more than 40 years. <laughs> I've grown in many, many ways, um, and I don't know whether I am, shall we say, an orthodox reformed uh, Christian believer. <clears throat> But pretty much so. Um, and I think that does, I had forgotten that part of what I had said some 40 years ago, um, more than 40 years ago. Um, but I think that's, that is indeed the, the view I still hold. Um, and I think it really does reflect how um, even trying to approach these issues of faith and practice, um, my philosophical um, bent um, was pretty clear uh, as even as an undergraduate and I think it's probably stayed Very with me interesting. Yeah. well that brings me to your first book published in 1986 by Clarendon Bentham and the Common Law Tradition and obviously I haven't been able to read the whole book mm -hmm. and I'm very much guided by a review by Michael Lubbin mm -hmm and also a recent critique by Ferraro in right. the Journal of Bentham Studies. So I've just picked up on a few points. On page 9, you say your main theme of the book is Bentham's theory of adjudication. Mm -hmm. And after a thorough analysis of Bentham's writings, you concluded, page four, th five, three in the book, that his overall theory of law, which is supposed to unite positivist ideas in a code and utilitarian principles via methods of adjudication, is self-defeating. Mm -hmm. So your overall conclusion on page 459 is that Bentham's theory is valuable, not in, and I quote, his successful treatment of the problem, but in his having brought it to our attention. Right. Mm. I wondered if this is perhaps not damning or faint praise. Well, um, philosophers oftentimes um, offer their most sincere esteem through their most severe criticism. Um, and um, this was an attempt to take very, very seriously um, the work of a... Um, a legal theorist who had been well-known um, and 
not in his lifetime, but to a certain extent subsequent to that, quite influential. But not nearly as influential, I thought, as he could have been had he actually published most of what he had written. So a large part of this um, value of this book, should it have any, um, is that it brought to attention of legal philosophers and political philosophers and historians, I suppose, um, in the mid-80s through the end of the 20th century. Um, elements of Bentham's thought that were just not well known um, and put them together um, in a way with an attempt to um, make them as coherent a theory as possible. Um, so I worked all the way through that and I came to the end that the struggles he had are, are struggles with, with deep and um, abiding issues and that his struggles are worth paying attention to. The fact then that his proposed solution didn't quite achieve what he would like seems to me less um, a worry to us um, and certainly no reason for putting aside thinking about the, both the problems he articulated and the way in which he approached them. Um, it seems to me that, that um, there's still much to be gained from the study of that, though in the end I thought it was, it was unsuccessful. Um, that's a, a typical way in which we philosophers um, approach the matter. Um, one wouldn't be a, um, a card-carrying philosopher if you said, well, this is all what he did, and it is just wonderful. Um, most of us want to be a bit more critical of things. Yes. Ferraro discusses your direct utilitarian theory. Right. Do you believe Bentham implied that judges could lay aside the code in order to adjudicate on utilitarian principles? And Ferraro says that your interpretation needs modification to where judges have flexibility only in procedural matters. He yeah. says that Bentham meant to give them the power only to refer the code to legislation for modification. I wonder, Professor Costima, whether you still stand by your radical revisionist interpretation some 30 years later. Well, what Ferraro did, um, to his credit, was he identified texts that I had not seen. Um, and um, so in order to, um, to assess the strength of his argument, I need to look more carefully at those. Um, my plan is to, one of the, another project you asked what my projects are, my plan is um, in the next year or so to bring out a second edition of Bentham and the Commonwealth Tradition in which I attempt to address just that, those criticisms. I don't have an immediate answer on that. Um, uh, Ferraro has done a very good job of looking at texts um, and um, it remains I think for me to see whether the case is um, serious enough. I'm willing to moderate, modify the conclusion should the texts warrant it. I'm um, mindful however that sometimes um, we may disagree not about the reading of texts, but about um, the underlying philosophical assumptions that are being made. And I'm not sure that he and I would agree on that. So what I need to do is to be sure that, in particular, I want to understand better what he, he takes, the commitments of a direct, what I call a direct utilitarian, um, might allow. Um, and, and if um, it turns out that Bentham was indeed um, insistent that judges not um, appeal to their own um, assessments of, as he called, the balance of utilities, all things considered, in making important decisions um, in the course of adjudication. If that indeed was his view, then we need to really seriously go back and um, think of a, a whole lot of other more fundamental commitments that Bentham had made and tried to figure out how to resolve that. It's possible that Bentham was inconsistent um, and that he has no coherent theory. One of my friends is inclined to think that. Um, one major criticism of this book is that it, it makes Bentham more coherent than he in fact was. That's fascinating. Um, so, um, but I'm inclined to say let's give this um, really intriguing um, 
engaged and um, creative mind as much benefit of the doubt as possible and see what we can do with the materials he provides us in um, coming up with uh, perhaps very nuanced but nevertheless overall coherent view of the um, relationship between practical reasoning of the judges and um, a structure of rules and a system of rules and the like. Um, Ferrara's um, work here will be very important in my addressing that again, um, though I'm not willing yet to accept that modification is necessary. Understand. So after all your study of Bentham, what would you say are his main contributions for modern legislators and adjudicators? Um, one thing that, um, there, there are perhaps two or three. One is that he is, he took um, um, a standard model of law and treated that as a kind of uh, template for understanding the operation of law. A standard model of law being a so-called command model. Laws are commands of someone who has sovereign power. And then he understood sovereignty in a certain way typical way. Um, he took that, but, um, and, and that's, that's a, a, a notion that's common to many, many theorists prior to Bentham and well after. You find it in Hobbes um, very prominently, but in many, many other theorists before Hobbes and between Hobbes and Bentham. Um, Hobbes took that, Bentham took that command model and then worked it so carefully um, and over over a time trying to think of, of various applications of it and developments of it so that by the time we get to um, a mature theory of law the command model has pretty much been um, exploded and, and developed into something altogether different um, I think that his need to to work both with that model and to um, transform it in order to meet the needs of what he took to be the demands of rationality on a legal system. Um, that struggle he had is a struggle that's well worth thinking about in legal theoretical terms, generally. Um, the other thing is that while he was thought, he is often been thought to be the kind of originator of, or one of the most important originators of um, contemporary legal positivism. Um, unlike other positivists, he thinks that what's essential to law is reason and rationality and providing reasons for people to act and not just commands backed by some kind of sanction. Um, and he wraps that up in, in um, a, a very complicated discussion about the role of, of um, system and um, systematicity in law. Um, I think that's well worth paying attention to in our thinking about um, our theorizing about common law um, or civil law systems. The other thing um, that in, in Bentham's work that I think is especially important, and I give it some treatment in the book, but I've done it um, more in subsequent work, um, is that Bentham took the publicity of law to be one of its most important um, attributes. Law has to be something that is always accessible and um, those who are to be governed by law must be able always to um, understand what the law requires of them but also be in a position to hold those who are administering the law accountable to that law. Um, so what we have is um, it turns out a fairly radical view of what um, we would now call the rule of law requires. Um, so this notion of publicity and accountability um, at the core of his notion of a law um, is what we now think of as an important part of the rule of law. So there's another aspect of this, um, which I haven't seen fully in the book, but I have now explored more, um, and I think is really um, a valuable contribution. I gave a lecture in China in 2012 on just this. Um, topic. Um, it's called the soul of justice because Bentham at one time says that publicity is the soul of justice. Um, <clears throat> and um, so I presented the 
the uh, thesis there of, of Bentham's sort of radical publicity view, um, which of course is contrary to a good bit of what Chinese government um, structure and um, ideology um, would find comfortable. Um, so it was, it was an interesting time to uh, present that, that kind of issue, and things have gone even sadly worse in the last couple of years since then. Yes, very interesting. Professor Postina, looking at your publications, your titles, I noticed that the name Bentham occurs 11 times in the title of 52 articles produced since and etc. produced since 1971 to 2006. That's nearly one in five. And after that, none. So Bentham's work was clearly a consuming interest until 2006. Has there been a conscious shift in your research emphasis since then? Well, no, I've actually come back to Bentham again. And so, in, as I say, in 2012, I wrote another paper, and I will be doing so again. Um, so it's not so much a, a shift away as that I've been working on Bentham and then a number of other things as well all along. Um, there's a number of papers on David Hume, for example, and his moral philosophy, which I find um, I found really important and interesting. Um, a number of um, papers on, as I say more recently, on the rule of law. A number of papers, especially um, for a while, on the idea of custom and convention both in international law and in domestic law context, um, which have nothing really very much to do with Bentham at all, but actually much more um, issuing from my attempt to understand classical common law views of law, quite different from Bentham's, um, and their relevance to um, 20th century, um, both political and legal theoretical problems. Um, so in a way this book um, provided a kind of template for a lot of the research that I did subsequently to its subsequent to its publication. There's more work on Bentham. There's a whole lot more work on common law, both its history in the 17th century and classical context, um, and then common law notions. I have a work on um, argument by analogy. I have I'm a piece on law system systemic character. I have a piece I on the only piece I actually sang at one point. It's a piece on melody in the law. And I say there's an analogy between melody and law. Legal reasoning. Um, so on one side I'm, I'm thinking about um, um, that common law issue. And then some of the, the um, notions of custom and and convention and common reasoning that um, I needed to further develop those in a contemporary context, not a historical issue from that strand. And then there are a couple of chapters on Hume in the book, and I've worked on Hume more generally on its own, and then I've worked on Bentham subsequent to this as well. So there's kind of three strands of, of the work after that, and then some others that were um, really not related to this at all. Thank you. Which brings us to your latest book, where you are a single author again. The Legal Philosophy in the 20th Century, The Common Law World. And this book charts the course of two widening streams of thought that are epitomized in lectures given by Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1897 and Hart in 1957 mm -hmm. in Boston. And you place much emphasis on the development of these streams on the personalities of these two giants. So clearly, Professor Postina, you never met Holmes, but I wondered mm. whether you ever had the chance to meet Hart during that time. Yes, um, I I met him just briefly in 1973 or four. I'm not sure when it was. Um, but when I and when I went back to England to study to do work for the Bentham um, book and working in the Bentham project at University College London. I did have an opportunity to meet with him f several times in Oxford over the over Bentham materials, especially. Um, so I did get to know him. Um, he was a giant. He also was a, a wonderfully warm and generous man, um, and um, really 
was one of the most important figures in English speaking um, legal philosophy in the 20th, 20th century. I wondered as well whether you had a chance to meet his wife at any point. Jennifer. Um, I, my good friend Nikki Lacey, Nicola Lacey, who wrote a wonderful biography of Hart, um, actually was very close to them. Um, and she and I um, conferred about some things. Oh, there was another occasion in which I um, actually spent time with Hart. Um, there was a, um, a conference in Hart's honor at the Hebrew University in Israel in 1984. And I presented a paper there. Um, and he commented on that. He was critical of some parts of Hart's work. Um, um, and he was very generous at that point. Um, and uh, Nikki told me later that he spent a lot of time thinking about the problems that I had raised with his paper. And, um, that encouraged me because I didn't think it was, and that was very early in my career. So in the conclusion to this book, page 577 to 78, you say that in the Middle Ages, quoting Kelly, 1976, jurisprudence was the true philosophy and that it lay at the very heart of theoretical studies and that law, I quote again, penetrated the practical dimensions of daily social life. Later, you say, page 583, that in modern Anglophone jurisprudence, you sense that natural law theory has returned and there is room for a genuinely philosophical jurisprudence sensitive to both legal practice and the place of law in human social life. And I wonder how you see this return to formal values manifesting itself. So the story of this book, there, there are a number of different plot lines, but one of them um, is that in um, the stream that issues from John Austin in the latter part of the 19th century through to Hart and a good bit of um, um, Anglo, let's call it British, um, legal philosophy, um, became more and more um, restricted in the range of questions and issues it wished to deal with. Um, more and more um, willing to say, well, that's not a problem for us. Um, whereas um, Bentham, for example, had this just wide open compendious kind of view of what someone concerned philosophically about law would be interested in. Um, so I thought there was an, a, an increasingly narrow, narrow or narrowing kind of view. The stream that came out of Holmes, a more American one, um, was always much more um, open, but far less disciplined. So you had a, a very care, um, highly disciplined, um, rigorous, precise kind of legal theory that got narrower and narrower, um, as opposed to a legal theory that was open just about everything, latitudinarian, but not very disciplined. Um, and so there's kind of struggle between those two. Um, what I think is happening now is that we've become a bit more aware of um, two things, I think. We're less, we're much more, I'm hoping this is true, much more um, interested in looking at the role of contemporary issues relative to the history of legal theory as it's been well, as has been written and thought about since um, the, the um, ancient times. Um, this sort of echoes my prejudice here, but um, I think legal philosophy, like any philosophy, is done best only when it's done through its history. Um, and I think we're finally getting back to that, so there's much more attention to the history of these things than before. And I think that can be energizing. Oddly enough, I think what it can do is provide us with... Um, new critical perspective on the issues that we otherwise take to be sort of obvious and allows us to stand back and challenge some of the um, totally, um, accepted views. Um, and um, like learning a new language um, gives you new perspective on your own. Um, looking at the contemporary legal theoretical problems from um, something of its history 
um, can really give us a, 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 an enlivened critical perspective on them. Um, I think we're now opening up a bit more to that, and so that's very good. Also on the other side, uh, um, there's more openness to um, um, thinking about normative political issues in the context of, of um, um, an analytical legal theory than there was some time ago. So those two elements together. It's not really natural law theory in the, in the old-fashioned sense of it, um, except that natural law theory was, first of all, not a theory that law and morality are somehow the same, but rather a view that law is a kind of human enterprise that we can understand only by setting an enterprise in its larger human and social context and understanding all of that. Um, I take that to be the, the key insight of uh, natural law theory, and um, I'm hoping that we have actually moved, begun to move more in that direction. Professor Postuma, do you think that there are sort of analogous or parallel philosophies for civil law and Islamic? legal systems? Sadly, I know little about Islamic um, theories. Um, this book, um, Legal Philosophy in the 20th Century, The Common Law World, is actually a part of a 12-volume treatise. Um, it's volume 11 of the 12-volume treatise, um, which I and my colleagues in Bologna have been um, working on producing since the mid-90s. Um, the first volumes came out in, oh, I don't know, early 2000, 2003, something like that, of, of this uh, new millennium. Um, the aim of that was to, to build bridges um, and, to, and to have a kind of cross-fertilization of ideas. Um, I'm inclined to think that there's a lot that um, thinking about common law tradition can offer to um, the civilian tradition. I also think that Bentham, who was not a, um, a typical common law theorist at all, um, has a great deal to offer and um, would, would be um, m much attractive to um, our civil law um, brothers and sisters in legal theory. I tried to make it intelligible to audiences that are not already sort of inured in the common law system, but actually have are coming to it from the outside, from outside of this tradition. Anyway. Very interesting. I mean, do you in any way see that there is some element in these ideas that that in some way gels with Professor Ellett's views on international law? Yeah. Um, if sort of if we bury enough yeah. of our differences. Yeah. That the sort of you know me and vision. Yeah. Well, I'm yes. Um, well, what I'm inclined to think is that while the um, the roots of um, of the civil tradition and the roots of the common law tradition are different, they're not radically different, um, and. Um, Inevitably, the kind of things so, so so the differences between us, bec which become in in um, particular cases, look they look very very large. Um, when you step back a bit, they are much less fundamental, um, and that um, the importance, for example, of something like um, um, ongoing judicial development of law um, through interpretation and the, and and precedent is a part of civil systems, though it's not part of the civil ideology. Um, and, in the, and in the common law system, there's much more common law approach. There's much more um, a need for and concern for a kind of systematic structure of it, uh, much less tolerance for what um, T.E. Holland said in the late... 19th century, that common law is a chaos with an index. Um, there's not a tolerance for that. So the drive for something like um, a more systematic approach. To it. So I think there are um, places and um, motivations for uh, coming together. And um, uh, I hope that in, in part some of the, the reflections on the common law that I've engaged in 
um, and, and this book might provide some um, basis for that um, bridge building. Notions of sovereignty have figured prominently in positivist thinking. Mm -hmm. US, the US and the UK used to have sovereign parliaments, I'm using the term loosely, and while the US still has, we no longer do uh, in some senses. And I wonder how you would characterize the situation here, the mm. notion of sovereignty in light of the Commission and the European Court of right. Justice. Um, in some ways, that's one of the most interesting historical developments um, in um, English law, I think. Um, English law has been forced in a way that American law has not to internationalize itself. Um, American still, um, American system can still be very um, insular. Um, that's much harder for um, the British, for the English system. Um, I think it's unclear just how that's going to develop. A, a lot of it, a lot of, in, in, in a way, the um, law here follows the politics rather than leads it. Um, though in some respects it has to lead it as well, but it really follows it. Um, and the politics of that connection now um, are really up, up, up for grabs. Um, much more so than, than back in the 90s. Um, I was seriously considering moving to London. I mean, one of the things that attracted me about it at the time, and, and teaching in London, um, what attracted me at the time was what I thought was a, a, a really um, dynamic movement of a kind of broadening of English law into, the, into Europe and um, a kind of unification of it. I think that's much less evident now. Um, Nevertheless, notions of sovereignty, um, that is um, national sovereignty, and so a legal system sovereignty, um, are much in question and much being rethought now. Um, uh, I, I don't have myself a good sense of where that might go. Well, Professor Pasquino, that brings us to the end no. of this interview. And all that remains is for me to thank you again very much for a fascinating account, which our readers will greatly enjoy reading and listening to. And I hope that we can follow up in a few months' time, mm -hmm. and perhaps you can give us some of your concluding observations about right. your time here at Cambridge. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Good.